Hey everyone, it's Lisa with Are You My Cousin? And we are here, ooh, we are here to chat about genealogy. Hang on one second. I've it's let me pull that off. Something is hey Louise, it's good to know you're here. I do not know why that pulled up, but we will take care of that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. You never know. This is live, live stream. Um, let's start that one over again. Hey, everybody, I'm Lisa with Are You My Cousin? It's Thursday, so we are here to talk all things genealogy again. And as you can see, I am not by myself. I have Mary Eberly of DNA Hunters with me. Hey, Mary, it's so nice to have you again. Well, thanks for having me, Lisa. It's great oh, to be you're here. Welcome. So if you are new, if you are just, if you haven't joined us before, I wanted to introduce myself. I am Lisa. Um, I have, I'm the owner and creator over at Are You My Cousin? where I have lots of blog posts, I think I'm over 300 now, to, to talk about how to do genealogy research, how to find your ancestors. And Mary is the owner of DNA Hunters. She is a genetic genealogist um, extraordinaire, I think, and um, my go-to DNA person because I'm just, I know just enough to be dangerous on DNA, guys. Um, so Mary comes with me uh, over here with us once a month to talk about topics related to DNA. So I will drop her her website, or both of our websites, down in the chat in just a moment. And if you're watching on replay, you'll find those in the description. So it's wonderful to see everybody coming in. Hey, Danny, it's good to see you again from a rainy Loveland, Ohio. Yes, I understand it is rainy up there. Um, I was watching the weather earlier. And Louise from Ontario, nice to see you. I am sitting in a balmy 75 degree <laughs> North Carolina. Um, it's quite lovely outside and Mary's freezing up in her hometown where it's not going to snow. <laughs> I love the weather. Anyway, let us know where you're watching from. It's always fun to see where everybody is, is watching from if you would like. And while you guys are finding us and coming into the chat, let me just give you a heads up about a couple of things that are happening here at Are You My Cousin and really exciting things, I think. Now, if you are watching on YouTube, I would love it if you would hit the subscribe button and that way you will be notified when I go live and when I post new videos here on the Are You My Cousin YouTube channel. It tells the algorithms that, hey, we wanna hear more genealogy and that works. Um, so that would appreciate if you'd hit the subscribe button if you feel so inclined. Now, next week, I want you to mark your calendars. You are not going to want to miss next week's um, Facebook slash YouTube live. I have Jen Allen from, Root, from Roots Tech. She is the head person of coordinating Roots Tech um, that's coming up. And she is going to join me. We are going to be talking about getting the most out of Roots Tech 2023. It is the first time we're doing the, they're doing the hybrid model. So in person as well as virtual at home from your couch. Plus, we've got some really fun activities that we're going to actually play or we're going to do. You will actually get an opportunity to see if you are related to me in some form or fashion. So we're very, very excited. Watch your inbox, mark your calendar, and I think we're going to have a fantastic time. And if you are not registered for Roots Tech, you absolutely want to do that. It is coming up fast. It is free. If you're doing the virtual, it's around $98, I think, for an in-person experience. It might be a little bit more now. I think there was some early bird pricing going on. So check it out. It's a um, great way to further your education when it comes to genealogy research. All right, let's see who all is here. Hey, Dave from Washington. Elaine is also from Washington. And we have Arkansas and Laura from Michigan. Tennessee is in the house. Georgia, Florida. Well, you guys are all over the place. Hey, Amy's from Oregon. And another Ontario. Wonderful. I'm so glad. Thank you, guys. I know I recognize a lot of these names, Mary. I, you probably do, mm -hmm. too. And, you know, I really appreciate um, you supporting those of you who show up week after week. I do. I really appreciate your support. It means the world to me. And I know it does to Mary. Um, Louise, Louise says she's connected through Roots Tech relatives with her with your son's partner. Wow. Sixth cousin, three times removed. That's interesting. I love that whole relatives at Roots Tech experience. It's a really fun fun experience to, to see. Okie doke. Hey, Tammy. Oh, thank you so much, Tammy. That's really sweet. All right. Let me check my notes, make sure I'm not, not, I'm missing anything. I am, I think I've given you all the announcements. Definitely. Perfect. So again, we are here to talk why DNA with um, Mary and Mary, thank you so much for doing this. Cause I know we had some questions from that. We were hoping to have, you know, I knew 
we've had some questions about it in the past. So you were like, that would be a great idea to talk about. So I'm going to actually go ahead and turn it over to you. If there's anything you want to, to talk about as far as what you're doing in your business, but feel free or just jump right into YDNA. Sure. Well, thank you, Lisa. And thanks everybody for being here today. Um, I'm going to do this in a two part fashion. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk about the basics of why DNA testing and uh, in light of family tree DNA, releasing some new tools uh, next time, which will probably be uh, early March. Um, I'll talk about the big Y test and what you can learn from that, as well as uh, at least one other new feature that they have. So uh, without further ado, I will present my YDNA part one. It's always interesting to hear the new things that are coming out. And this time of year with Roots Tech, they, most company, a lot of companies are announcing new features. Right. I just got an email this morning from them talking about these new features. And I, I hadn't heard about them, mm -hmm. but I just, um, I, you know, all of a sudden it becomes like a lot of material and it's easier to split it into two. Um, so starting out with using DNA, excuse me, why DNA for genealogy research? Mm -hmm. You can use why DNA to research your patrilineal line meaning your father's 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 line. Uh, and when you, when you use Y-DNA, it can provide evidence to support that branch of your family tree. You can also use it to find someone. So a lot of times people are wondering who their great-grandfather was on that branch or their great-great or so on, or even their father. You can use it to find a surname. You know, so sometimes families know that their name got changed and they want to know um, their real surname, meaning their biological surname. And I think it also can be used to cause confusion. So I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. But uh, just to say before I go on, you know, people will contact me and say, you know, I'm Joe Smith and I've done a Y DNA test. And boy, you know, either it's got the wrong surname, not Smith, or it's got five different surnames. So then it's then there is the confusion as to why that is the case. There are a couple of companies doing Y DNA testing. The first is Family Tree DNA, and they do full Y DNA testing. It's a separate test from their autosomal DNA test, which is called the family finder test. And their Y DNA test gives you your Y haplogroup and haplotype, which I'll explain in just a minute. And then it gives you information about your deep ethnicity estimates on that patrilineal line. So your father's 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 line. It also, very importantly, gives you why DNA matches. And I say that's important because we need matches uh, in order to do the genealogical research that goes along with this. Switching over to 23andMe and also living DNA, as part of their autosomal DNA test, they will provide your Y haplogroup, um, that is, if you have a Y chromosome, they'll say it is this haplogroup, and I'll explain that term in just a minute, um, as well as your deep ethnicity estimate on that Y line, or your direct paternal line, or your patrilineal line. You know, so we have at least those three different terms to describe that father's 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 line. One thing I wanted to warn you about if you're comparing results from two different companies is that you can end up with two brothers who share the same father uh, having what appears to be different haplogroups. So on the top is my brother, uh, brother number one. And 
let's see, I'm gonna get a little, trying to pull up the little laser pointer. Uh, that, okay, here, brother number one. So he was the first one to test, uh, even before I tested. And he was told that his paternal haplogroup, meaning his Y haplogroup, is RL47. My second brother tested at Family Tree DNA, and they said that his predicted haplogroup was RM269. And this could lead one to think that maybe they had two different fathers because, you know, why is brother two this haplogroup and brother one that haplogroup? Looking um, at 23andMe, they, they give you a timeline. So this is from the L47 brothers results. And that points out that this L47, which is a subtype of R, uh, that it arose fewer than 10,000 years ago, and that it arose from this more general RM269, which is 10,000 years old. And that's what my brother at Family Tree DNA came up as. So this shows that uh, you know this is a more uh, basic group uh, that includes things like RL47, um, and you know that it, that this is consistent with them having the same father. Mm. It, we've got these uh, different different uh, levels of resolution at the two different companies, and and sometimes if you go back far enough these uh, haplogroups were named with uh, alphanumerics, meaning letters and numbers. And so for example, this might be R1B1, uh, B2A1, and, and so on. And that just became very complicated. And instead, I think everyone at this point has adopted this naming system. Mm. But if you're in the scientific literature or if you're looking at some older materials, uh, so let's say you tested your brother and you printed it out 10 years ago, it might still have that alphanumeric naming. And you can always go online and um, Google that alphanumeric to see what today it would be called. So here is where I finally explain what a haplogroup is. Um, and that is, it is a, a, a type or um, that's, I guess that's an unfortunate word because the next thing is haplotype. But basically it is where they're taking everybody. So all people with Y chromosomes and they're saying, oh, we can, there are these differences and we'll split them down into these groups. And the basis for this are um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And those are just individual places in our DNA that vary with in, within the population. So if we're looking at the Y chromosome and a really specific place on that chromosome, part of the population will have one DNA letter, so G, A, T, or C, and then a proportion of the, the population will have another letter. So let's say one group has A, one group has T, um, that would be a single nucleotide polymorphism. And that's the kind of testing that's used to form these haplogroups. There's another kind of DNA testing called short tandem repeats. And this is where uh, DNA is uh, in these short units that get repeated. So here we're talking about the Y chromosome and specific places within the Y chromosome where we've got these short tandem repeats. 
And this information gives you your haplotype. So um, I believe FTDNA is the only company that gives you your haplotype. So when I say two different kinds of testing, I mean at the lab. So one company, Family Tree DNA, has a lab and the lab does two different kinds of testing for the SNPs and the STRs. So I'll just illustrate uh, these SNPs. Uh, like I said, it's these little changes, teeny tiny changes. You know, we have 3 billion base pairs or nucleotides and some of them uh, differ from person to person. And uh, this would be example of you. And then you might have another person. They also have a T here. Um, they have a C there. So if this were the full amount of DNA used to look at these haplogroups, we would say you and person one are the same haplogroup. But then we have person two who has four differences. So we've got one difference here, uh, a difference here, a difference there, and a difference there. So these little tiny changes are what, it, what is used to make these haplogroups. And there are 20 major haplogroups. Um, they are mostly named with letters so that um, the example of my brothers, they both were R, the R haplogroup. Uh, and there's, you know, ABC uh, and so on. Down here, I have somebody with a haplogroup. So it's an I broad group, and then this S6270. And this person has been assigned to this haplogroup. And it talks about, um, this is a subtype of this broader I M253, and talks about roots in Northern France, so that's part of what I was saying, this deep ethnicity estimate. But remember, it's just on your father's, father's, father's line. So this uh, also is found within Viking and Scandinavian populations in Northwest Europe and has since spread to Central and Eastern Europe, where it's found at low frequencies. Haplogroup I represents one of the first peoples in Europe. You know, so that's some very, very deep um, ethnicity information. And it gives you an idea of where your ancestors over time could have existed or their relatives existed. Okay. This is from that same individual, so that with that confirmed haplogroup of IS6270. And confirmed is important because what they tell you with your test is um, your probable haplogroup. So if you if we go back all the way back to my brother's results at family tree DNA, it did not say confirmed. It just said probable. And with this person, we had him do some additional DNA testing. So he did the original, uh, I don't know if it was 111. I think it was 111 um, testing. And then he was trying to figure out who his father's father was. And somebody in a, a, a Y DNA project, so these are projects at Family Tree DNA, said it would help if you could further define this Y DNA haplogroup. So they paid for um, they paid for additional tests to be done. So the sample was there. Um, you pay money, they do some more testing with more 
snips. And uh, this was to be presumed positive based on that. This is positive, positive, and then negative. And it's just showing that um, these extra SNPs were tested. So this was tested, this was tested. Um, this 6270 is up here. And um, this, this little window, the StreamYard window is hiding it. Um, let me see if I can turn that off. Um, I've got a clear shot. I, I, oh, I see what you're... I would expect the 6270 to be green, but I can't see it. Can, can you see it? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. 6270, yes, we can see it. It's green. It's, it's green. green? Okay, yeah. good. So he, he was showing that he had these additional uh, SNPs present, and then he uh, 6270 was the last one that came up positive, and that's why he's got this haplogroup. And that helped us. Um, we were trying to see if he, his father's father, was part of this one family that had a specific surname. And the project administrator said, well, all of the Mr. So-and-sos are positive for this one SNP. Hmm. And in this case, the, the client wasn't positive. So he was more distantly related to these people than what we originally thought. So this, you know, this really helped. It helped in that it clarified the relationship to a group of men with the same surname. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately it excluded that, that family, um, you know, cause then you're kind of back to the drawing board of, well, okay, if it's not that, then, um, right. you know, where, who, you know, which, which branch does he belong to? Right. Okay. And this is how you're, you're able to add either individual SNPs. So if you're in a project and somebody says, you need to test this specific SNP, if there's a little basket, you can add it. Um, I guess here, this add goes to something maybe up above um, and, or, a lot of times they offer SNP packages where they know that a certain set of SNPs go together and that set of SNPs are used to define a broader haplogroup. group. So, um, so it's just when you're looking at your results, you can see that and you're invited to add them to your test. Okay, so that's about SNPs and haplogroups. For haplotypes, this goes back to those STRs. And I just drew out an imaginary uh, STR where the, the unit that's being repeated is this GAG. And we have these repeats throughout our genome and most of the time, they're just some variability that's out there. And other times, sometimes they're associated with diseases. So, um, it, you know, in this, in these cases, it's, it's not the disease related ones. It's just things or these repeats that occur on the Y chromosome. And it will be at a specific location. And we've got here, we've got seven repeats. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This person would get a score of seven, whereas this person would get a score of eight. And typically these repeats are passed from father to child uh, without th this kind of a change. But that's not 100% true. So, you know, it gets a little imperfect, but, you know, it's biology, it's, it's not physics. Um, so you will get the certificate that tells you, this, this is a blow up of it. It'll tell you, you know, for this marker, so this is an STR marker called DYS390, 
this person had 22 repeats. At the next marker, uh, this person had 14 repeats. And you know, you can, you can, uh, you know, what, what good is this, I guess, is the question. And that is, it's this information that leads to your match list. So going back to this, in your match list, you would have people who, and, and you were this person, well, your match list would consist of people who had seven of these repeats. And then if you ordered a, a 37, so it's called Y37 or Y111. So if you ordered a 37 test, you would have 37 of these, which would show up down here. And those 37 results would be what's used to match you up with other people in the database. Mm -hmm. If you did 111, then there are more um, STRs that add up to 111. And as you can imagine, the more you test, the finer your ability and, and the greater your ability is to find somebody who's biologically close to you. So you might have a Y37 test that comes back with, you know, a bunch of different surnames. Mm -hmm. And that's common in certain populations just due to their sociological practices. So for example, I see that with Irish people where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where names, surnames have changed for various reasons, like uh, clan affiliations, uh, where if you're affiliated with the clan, you might have one surname, even though biologically you're not related to each other. And for those people with a bunch of surnames in their list, if they go up to 111, then their list might become much more specific. You know, so you might mm -hmm. end up just with the O'Neills. So that's... Um, that is about finding your matches. Today, you can order a Y37 test for about 119. The Y111 test is 249. And then we also have the big Y700 uh, for 49, or 449. And this, I will talk about more next time we, we get together. And that has um, more STRs and more SNPs. And it's able to tell relationships even better than the Y111 test. Mm -hmm. And I have a great example of that that I'll share with you next time. Can I ask a quick question? Tammy had a question oh, sure. in the Facebook group. Do you want to take that or do you, is that, would you feel better about taking that toward the end? Do you think? Um, oh, I can take it now. Okay. So she's asking how common when you do the 37 marker, is it to match exact? Cause they're working on the big, getting the big Y done. How, how common, I think it just depends, you know, it's, it depends upon the people in the database mm -hmm. and you. So I've uh, probably mentioned this before, but I tested my brother at 67. Mm -hmm. So they used to also sell the 67 test. Right. And he had zero matches at the 67. So that uh, wasn't, well, that, that led me to believe that, um, you know, he's, he's unique. Uh, <laughs> And uh, maybe someday he'll have some matches. Mm -hmm. And and then I dropped it because you can you can always look at what's your match list at a lower level. Mm -hmm. So I dropped it to 37 and he matched this man with a totally different surname and only one man. And um, when I looked at where those two surnames came from, they were both from th the same region of Germany. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that, you know, if we go back far enough in time, you know, somewhere these two families were connected. Gotcha. So, you know, in that case, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't super helpful. Right. And he had 
virtually no matches. Um, and I've talked about the people who have, you know, five different surnames or 10 different surnames. Mm -hmm. um, and then this example that I now have on the screen is from a male adoptee looking for his birth father. And this was super helpful. This is at the 37 level marker. He had eight matches and I've, I've got uh, five of them on the screen. And what was really helpful is that with the exception of the second person, this guy, all of his matches had a form of the surname mm -hmm. Cannon. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, probably a, uh, a German version, another German version. I think this is a German version too, with a different prefix. Um, I don't speak German, but I, I did ask my sister and she seemed to think that was likely the case. And then this guy who's just Mr. Cannon. And, um, you know, they're, they're listing their oldest known ancestors. And here we've got a specific ancestor uh, who's Sterling Cannon. Here, um, the oldest known ancestor is Von Kennen. So that, you know, that's interesting. And he's from Germany. It's almost this, this version of the name. Um, and another um, Von Cannon. And, and in the end, this guy's birth father was Mr. Cannon. So, you know, that's not going to be true 100% of the time, because if the if there was a break in the Y line, um, he could have been, you know, Mr. Smith. But chances were that the birth father was going to be a canon or, so, you know, some version of it. And the um, family tree showed that this guy had, he had his family tree with that blue icon and that this gentleman also did the family finder or autosomal DNA test. So I was able to see that, that he matched the adoptee on this autos autosomal test as well. And in the end, uh, this was the second cousin once removed. You know, these, these people were likely more distant um, matches, or maybe they just remained in Germany and kept with the more German version of the name. You know, so, so if you end up getting results like this, it's amazing. You know, it's amazingly helpful. But like I said, it, it's not going to always work this way. You know, it's actually the minority of the cases where you've got such clear results. So I, I just, I wanna quickly mention another case where a man's father was adopted, but the, the father was deceased. And so they were looking for the biological parents of the adoptee, which would be the adult child's grandparents. And because this was on a direct Y line, the person tested and he had one of those results where there were a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of surnames. And in the end, I, I did find the grandfather and the grandfather wasn't his, that his surname was not in the list. You know, so in that case, it, uh, you know, I, I knew the, you know, I mean, I kind of kept in my head these surnames as I was examining the autosomal DNA results. And um, it just, you know, it didn't help. So just want to just to, just to let everyone know, it's not always the silver bullet you you hope for. Right, right. Definitely not. <laughs> yep. So let's see. Um, when you get your results, it will say genetic distance. And here we've got one for the, that same set of five matches. And we're looking at 37 markers. And um, this just means that they're matching on 36 out of 37 markers. So this is where the differences are. 
We also are provided at Family Tree DNA this tip calculator. And if you click on it, so this would be your match list. If you click on it, it will tell you the percent chance that you can find a common ancestor uh, within so many generations. Mm -hmm. And this is actually one of the things that they, um, Family Tree DNA is announcing just today that they have an improved tip calculator. So um, I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I'm excited to see that. You know, but this this gives you an idea of, well, should I, should I research, you know, this person's tree, if if he has a tree, or maybe you have to build a tree for him. Um, going back eight generations, uh, there's over a fifty percent chance you'll share an ancestor. So if it's possible to go back eight generations, then, you know, I would say, yeah, go ahead and. Um, it's worth investing the time in looking. But if it said, you know, you go back eight generations and there's only a 33% chance, then, you know, I would say, well, you know, it's probably not. And could, could you find somebody with a better percent chance? So I'm looking forward to seeing what those tip improvements are. Me too, definitely. Yeah. So here's an example about you know the, how you can use it in real life. And in this scenario, we've got a grandmother with two husbands and we've got you, someone who has a Y chromosome and we have John who has a Y chromosome. And um, so you, the, the two of you could do Y DNA testing. So if, let's say John is a known grandchild of Anthony and if, if you end up, your results are that you are haplogroup M and John is haplogroup I, then you know that this evidence supports Adam being your grandfather mm -hmm. and not Anthony. Because that, that haplogroup is going down uh, father, son, father, son, and, you know, father, son, father, son. So this is evidence to say that you descend from the other grandfather. Okay, so just keep in mind that the Y test is only about your patrilineal line. It's not your entire paternal line. So if you have a research question about your father's mother, um, then why DNA for you, on, on you is not going to help because you're getting that Y DNA through your father's father. And it, it can be helpful for deep ancestry, like those examples I gave about the French and the Vikings and the first peoples of Europe. Uh, and sometimes it's helpful for more recent ancestry, either finding a surname or finding a location um, I, I feel like, you know, sometimes we have these really difficult research questions in genealogy. And so, for example, did my ancestors come from Ireland or England, or did they come from England or Germany? Looking at your matches and where their oldest known ancestor lived gives you information about the location even if they might not give you information about the surname itself. Mm -hmm. And then it can answer some really specific questions like which man is the grandfather? Okay. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. All right. Let me bring us back to you. Hang on one second. Ta-da, we're back. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Um, I, so lot. Liza in the YouTube channel had a question. Um, she said her Macklem, or I guess it was more of a statement. My Macklem brother was, has only one exact match at his terminal SNP and his last name is Maitland. So close, right? A yeah. close surname. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. And I'm trying to stop sharing. Somehow I can't. Oh, um, I just pulled it down. You're, we can see you. I pulled down the, I just 
I pulled the presentation down so that you and I are on screen now. Okay. You may not be able to see that though. I might be able to do it for you. Nope, I don't want to do that. Oh yeah, I do. Hang on, I'm bringing her back, guys. I promise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we can see you. It's just uh, uh oh, Mary. If you can hear me, sound back on. I accidentally kicked you out. Accidentally. She'll come back. I promise, guys. <laughs> sit tight, sit tight. She'll be back. But if you have a question, go ahead and pop it in the um, group about the. Um, why DNA and be happy to answer as many as we can as soon as Mary pops back in. So um, just give her a second here. This is really, I find this really interesting. I know I've used the, it was why DNA that actually broke the brick wall that um, my co-researcher and I had on my, um, the surname White that we had researched here in North Carolina years ago. And so it was that um, why DNA that broke that brick wall down. Sorry about that, Mary. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Apparently wouldn't let me take your presentation down without taking you down. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, she's back, guys. So if you have a question, um, feel free to ask um, that you have that you have there. It, it is fascinating, Mary. I was, as you did this, and we're, um, I pulled up my dad's results from I did years ago. Oh, I, did, I think I did the 67 marker at the time. And um, it's interesting. He only matches it seven people and common and only two of them have his same surname. So five of them have different surnames, but it's interesting because they're all names that are in the same area of Virginia where he was. So they, mm -hmm. you know, they're not actually in my tree at this point, but I recognize the names from being close to that area. So definitely see that where that would, um, you know, help to narrow that down. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, I, it's been a while since I had looked at his particular one. So I was pulling up, thought, oh, you know, there, there's some a new matches there I haven't seen. Let me go see what else I can build out here because there's probably some, um, more ancestors as well as more stories that I can dig out because I do like the stories. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And that, that adoption case I mentioned with looking for the biological grandfather, mm -hmm. they were um, colonial Northeast people too. And mm -hmm. I, I haven't done enough work to know um, is, does that tend to be, is that a trend, you know, to have uh, yeah. the multiple surnames, you know, for sure for Irish people, mm -hmm. I, I see that because I've seen it enough, um, you know, uh, so it, it would be interesting to know that, you know, just. Yeah, um, I, that's, that's actually a really good question. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I do, I've worked several cases where, you know, basically, you know, they intentionally changed the name or, you know, like the, the man left and changed his, changed his identity just because um, I definitely have some name changes that occurred in my family. I have a name to some name changes that a surname change that really kind of, it went from Howard to Harwood to Harwood. I mean, it was, it just sort of, but it was all similar, I guess, to a point, but to this day, we don't know why mm -hmm. I mean, many of the, you know, people with this don't even realize they're related. They can live in the same town. Don't even realize they're related because the name we have no idea what fl was fluid. All right. We've got some questions that have popped okay. in here. Jean said, let's see. Jean said her brother is a Lloyd, took the F the family tree YDNA 111 and had only one match, a Jenkins. Furthest known ancestor was listed about 1840. The tester did not answer the email. What next? I would look to see if the tester did an autosomal DNA test and whether your brother matches him there. Mm -hmm. And then I would, um, if he's got, I would look to see if he's got a tree um, and, you know, if so, examine the tree. And then I would also look to see if that person has tested at Ancestry or another place. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes, like, once you're over at Ancestry, because that database is bigger, you can look at your shared matches and, you know, glean some more information. And I, I would look at your shared matches 
or they're called relatives in common at family tree DNA. Mm -hmm. And presumably, um, well, okay, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, interesting. When I looked at my dad's results, like nobody has a tree at, at family, <laughs> at family tree DNA. And so I was, that was my next was to go over. I was going over to ancestry to see what I could find there as well. Um, Amy said, can upload a DNA test from ancestry, pull out the Y DNA for her husband, or is it strictly a Y DNA test that needs to be done? Yeah. And un unfortunately it's strictly a Y DNA test that needs to be yeah. done. Yeah. Oh, she was asking, you mentioned the colonial East uh, or the East or she was no, but you were talking colonial Northeast or colonial New England. Oh boy. What's, what's the oh, difference? We're talking about uh, does, does the Northerner. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're talking Northeast. Yeah. I think she means colonial, like the New England area, right? So further North. Well, we, further then, north yeah. The, then yeah. Virginia. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Virginia is considered east, east coast, okay, mid, mid Atlantic. So my my project was more Virginia, Virginia. Okay, yeah. Um, Elaine said she knows this happens more than we think. Her Rogers family, dad's side, um, he married a lady. Her mother was a Rogers. So I'm thinking Alice Stacy married a distant cousin, George Washington Rogers, from around Salem, Beverly, Massachusetts, and Alice the mom. Betsy Rogers Stacy's from Brewster, Brewster Yarmouth area. All right. Okay. So what we're looking at here is, is basically, I think what she's saying is cousins intermarrying and uh -huh. I guess the names were changing that way. I think you're right. That does happen more than we think it does. Um, where some of those cousins might marry, you know, more distant cousins are marrying and we're getting matches and we know that, that tangles up a tree quickly. <laughs> right, right. In general, that tangles up a tree very quickly. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But with those, with those Irish or Scottish, I don't know if Rogers is one, you know, I think it's one or the other or both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there aren't that many surnames, right? Like Bridget Murphy. I, I have a cousin named Bridget Murphy mm -hmm. and she went to Ireland. And she said, you know, like she sees all these gravestones of Bridget Murphy's. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been to a lot of graveyards and I've never seen one. I saw one with my brother's name on it once, but mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like uh, everyone's, the, the first names are the same, right? There's mm -hmm. only so many Irish sur uh, first names. And then there's a pretty limited number of Irish mm -hmm. uh, surnames. So I would say I would want to build the trees back further to see. Um, but at the same time, she's right in that, that people are marrying cousins because we have a relatively small population who have entered the new world at that time. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, they're going to marry cousins. Yeah. And I would see it too, a lot because of my rural and, and more rural areas. I mean, they weren't, they're just the, the number of people that you can you know, marry at that point is, is, you know, density population, I guess is right. Like, you, yeah. you milk the cow and then you walk, you know, there's only so far you can walk and get right. home before you, you need to go to bed. Right. Right. Danny wants to know, he said, can, could he research his maternal grandfather's line by having his mother's brother or son tested for Y DNA? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Brother. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or his son. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a really good point, um, Danny, that, uh, you know, when, when I teach about this, it's always like, it's just your father's 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 line. But um, at the same time, in cases like this, you know, you've got these Y DNA lines in other, within your tree. And if you can find a direct uh, Y DNA descendant, then you could do Y DNA testing to try to see if maybe you could, you know, work that line back further. That's exactly what we did for my, um, my white family, that surname of white. Um, it's on my mother's side of the family, but fortunately it was, a, they had a lot of kids. So they're big. I have um, male cousins where we could, who were willing to test. And so we were able to go take that male line back because we were, you know, we struggled because it stopped at my grandmother, you know, so I had to go to one of her, ne her nephews. And uh, so one of my first cousins once removed did all one of, one of her brother's sons. Yeah. 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 So we were able to, to take it back that way. Um, so absolutely nice. you can do that. Yep. Yep. That's a good uh, point. 
Yeah. Tammy says, how does endogamy play into the Y DNA result along with autosomal? Oh, good question. Hmm. Um, That's a good question. Right, right. So I guess there would be more, you know, those matches, even though they're showing up on your father's 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 line, they might be related to you through other lines, you know, because when you have endogamy, you're related to your cousins through multiple lines. Mm -hmm. And I want to put in a plug um, for Leia LaPearl Larkin, who is a uh, half Cajun. So her mother is Cajun and there's, you know, that is a very endogamous community and she's offering classes through her own website on, mm. um, on endogamy in early March. So, and she's a great teacher. So I I'm thinking about attending because I learn something every time I hear her. Mm -hmm. So That would be, yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah. I'm not as well on that. Um, oh, Amy, let me clarify the whole Virginia, whether it's Northeast or South. Um, technically, it's the South. Um, I think when I mentioned Mid-Atlantic, that's kind of more of a, a newer terminology that Virginia would be like the Mid-Atlantic states would be like Virginia, North Carolina, you know, Maryland, that kind of area. Um, Northeast is tends to be, you know, I don't know what the official designation is of for that, but it would be, um, you know, just further north. Um, I would say probably north of DC. Is that what you would say? Or north of, I don't know. I think of it as just going northeast. But so Virginia, yes, Virginia would be south or what's considered mid Atlantic in more modern, I guess, a more common modern day type thing. All right. Yeah. I mean, or Tammy said she needs that class. Yeah. <laughs> no. That would be really helpful. That's, that's, yeah. Um, exactly. It's, I think it's all in your perspective, right? Like, I just drove back to Wisconsin from Florida mm -hmm. and you know, how did people speak as you're heading North? And then my, my joke is there's a, a, a cheese slash pork rinds gradient. And like, oh, as yeah. you go South, it's really, it gets harder and harder and harder to find cheese at the gas station, uh -huh. but it gets easier and easier and easier to find pork rinds. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's I hadn't really thought about that one. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but from, but Amy, from, a, from a research standpoint, you want to put Virginia in that more from a genealogy research. It acts, it's more of a Southern state to be able to act like a Southern, it's a Southern state. Um, yeah. Jean, oh, Jean's got me. She said Northeast usually includes New England plus New York and New Jersey and sometimes Pennsylvania. Okay. I knew it was around that New York thing. I wasn't hundred percent sure. Um, yeah. So um, definitely. Okay. Yeah. The pork run thing. Yeah. That'll definitely get you. That or, well, that and the, how strangers are nice to each other. Right. Like in the, Seriously? In, in the South, people say, hello, you know, when they meet, oh, we talk to know, everybody. They, they cross you on the sidewalk. And then I get home and I'm in my own neighborhood and I'm, you know, walking down the sidewalk waiting for the person to, for our paths to cross. And they're like looking at the ground and, <laughs> you know, you say, Oh, hi. And they just keep on going. <laughs> so, you know, the South definitely has that very nice hospitality and friendliness and willing to talk to strangers. So, yeah. Man, we just like to talk. What can I say? All right, guys. So I think we'll wrap. Thank you so much, Mary, for talking to us about this Y DNA, because I think so, I think it's one that sometimes we I don't want to say overlook, but there is since the autosomal is so much more common to test for. Sometimes we forget how to that we can use that Y DNA, um, you know, and, and in Danny's case and, you know, to be able to find a, a male relative on say, you know, it might be your mother's line, but if you can find that connection of somebody you can test it, that, you know, who's male, then you can continue that back. So that's a good point to remember. All right, guys, mm -hmm. don't forget next week, February 23rd, 3 PM right here, whether you watch on YouTube or on, um, Facebook, you will be able to watch the, um, family search my, or my um, we'll be on the family search page too. I think we will be talking about all things roots tech and having a lot of fun in the process. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, we've been doing lots of planning and can't wait to be able to bring that for you. All right, guys, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you so much for 
um, joining us today. I really do appreciate your support. Don't forget, if, you, if you're if you on YouTube, um, I'd love it if you would hit the subscribe button. That would um, let YouTube know that you want to hear more genealogy videos. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks.